Bold new approach to myth studies. Mythos and Cosmos re-examines ancient myth through the template of oral thinking and oral cosmology, contradicting decades of assumptions about the purpose and function of ancient mythology. Lundwald defines myth as the oral imprinting press of pre-literate peoples and shows that myth belongs to a complex and rational method of information transmission amongst oral peoples. Further, ancient mythology belonged to a cultus, which incorporated ritual and symbol in a cosmological system, which sought to found the sacred world. It's As such a, an, an ancient response of like your safety, your aura, yeah. your space was invaded. So like back in the day when we had to survive outside and we didn't have any homes, having something invade your space and i think back then your space would have been a lot larger than it currently is mm. because we're very safe nowadays but when something invades your space you automatically wake up because you have to like keep yourself safe progress goes backwards so the very first dynasties of ancient egypt were the most precise they were the most they made, they built the biggest structures you could build you could move bigger stone in the older the civilization and as civilizations get progress and get younger um their skills get really they, they go down it's like the opposite to like linear progress Welcome back to the Gnostic Informant, and you are about to attain true Gnosis. And I'm with some some heavy hitting channels right now: Derek from Myth Vision Podcast, Johanna James Funny Old World, and History with Kaylee. Hi. All of you are towering over me and subscribers, but it's all good. It's all good. Uh, we're gonna talk yes. about <laughs> so far. Some, yeah. <laughs> so we're gonna talk about how old is civilization. So I was mm. looking. At, I was looking at this the other day. The Sumerians, right? What do they come around like four thousand BC, thirty five hundred BC, somewhere in between there, whatever. Maybe even before that, some people say. But by the time we get to that period of time, they, we have a, a a base sixty mass system, a twelve month calendar, seven day week, a writing system, cuneiform, a postal system, mythology, arts, industries of bricklaying, metallurgy, government, military, trading systems, roads, astronomy, star mapping agriculture farming the wheel and musical instruments and they didn't all just come out of nowhere like they didn't just pop up out of, in thin air overnight so obviously probably though, mcdonald's as well mcdonald yeah they, they had some some, they had some sort of fast food but um but i bring that up is because like there's no way you're going to tell me that overnight they just decided to you know in, invent all these things within within one you know within one century mm -hmm. or something like that i think this happened slowly over time and the question is when when does the wheel come about? When does fire come about? When do humanoids become humids? It goes back farther. It goes back way farther. And uh, yeah, I think Gebekli Tepe is a, is a huge deal too because this is pointing to a system of people who are, if there's a temple somewhere, there's obviously a society. Hunter and gatherers aren't just going to build a temple, put all their eggs into a temple and start focusing all their resources on building temples and, and pillars. That just doesn't happen. You don't have time for that. If you're didn't if you're... purposely bury it. I mean, right. Oh, hold on. Let's go catch. No, put the. We don't have to survive. Don't worry about killing more cattle or killing more deer. Let's bury this for the next few years. How about that? Yeah. I don't know. Do there's think? a lot. Mm, uh, yeah, and there's well, not just Gebekli Tepe. There's even older ones as well that's been found. Karen Tepe, and there's like can't remember the name, but other Tepes. Um, that, that every time they do an excavation, they go, oh, this is a thousand years older. This is a thousand years older. So, um, yeah, it's, it's like, I, and I think many more of these sites are going to pop up in the next like 20, 30 years that we're going to be able to get like a real picture of like, oh no, I mean, pe humans were actually building these sites. Is it Karen Tepe? One of them has, they have not just a temple, they had homes, they had, um, they showed, it was like super advanced, basically more yeah. than just one temple structure. Yeah. Like it was a whole, basically a little town, because um, they had buildings. They had the first window ever found, which is cool. Like um, I think it was a yeah, like a circular window found. I think in Karen Tepe, 
and yeah they're going to start proving that people that that the the kind of story that we were told when we were at school like wasn't correct at all and humans are way more intelligent and a lot older than we think just because we've found writing and and settlements from like 600 6000 bc doesn't mean that there couldn't have been ones before i think it's the same as like the fossil record mm. the archaeological sites the fossil record that we currently have we know is incomplete and even the uh the archaeologists anthropologists they all know that it's incomplete but when we go by the fossil record and we look at species when they emerge and when we found them last that's the record that we have but we do know that they must have lived before and they probably lived until after because mm -hmm. we only found the fossils within this time frame it's the same with the archaeological discoveries of like the places of the Tastapella sites in turkey they currently have like 12 sites and that's the record that we have right we know that it existed in between that time frame yeah we know that currently there are 12 but there probably are more and some are older and some are younger. I think it's the same as like the fossil record. Wow. And where's the prototypes as well? Like I'd, I'd love to see the prototypes of all the carvings that go back to Tepe. Like surely there should be a rock somewhere with some like really dodgy looking animal. And then someone was like, nah, that was Bill's first attempt and it was really bad. And like, but we just find like these amazing finished products and it's like, we can't work out it, there must be in this expansive prototype version of events because we only find the beginning of what well, we only find like the finished product yeah it's like finding the apple pro 13 and not finding any of the ones before and being like oh, how did they do this well they, they must have had some sort of yeah. practice yeah like you don't just get a video camera without having like a, like an older type of camera before that or like some exactly some sort of system is that takes still images you know what i mean which is the problem that you get with a lot of the the earliest civilizations that we find is that the uh the progress goes backwards so the very first dynasties of ancient egypt were the most precise they were the most they they built the biggest structures you could build you could move bigger stone in the older the civilization and as civilizations get progress and get younger um their skills get really they, they they go down it's like the opposite to like linear progress that yeah. we find in ancient civilization it's really weird so they start off like coming out of the out of the bat like straight out the bat and they're um they're, they're brilliant and it's a bit weird you're like hmm, hmm. Yeah, you see some of the newer pyramids and they're like all raggedy and tiny and yeah they all they, uh, all of the all of the pyramid the new pyramids in egypt they're like mud brick and they um they're all like disintegrating right it's really weird. Maybe, it's like maybe. they lost the skill of it Maybe the dream by Pharaoh was true in the Bible where the fat cows would swallow the skinny ones and the skinny would. So there's like this deterioration happening. I'm, I'm teasing. Um, but this, there is something interesting about what you're saying. When I talked to Dr. Joshua Bowen, who's a Sumerian archaeological you know, scholar with a seriology and all that kind of stuff, he pointed out how writing developed in the Sumerian context was they started out with clay balls. It was clay tablets like they have all these clay tablets with all the mm -hmm. writings on them but before writing they had <clears throat> like if you wanted to give 10 sheep to your neighbor down the road and you know he has to travel 50 miles he won't be back for a few days you want to make sure he doesn't steal any of them so you send him with a contract ball made of clay with like on the ball they would put like marks certain marks that would represent sheep so they knew when they got there okay i'm selling you 10 sheep I need the money for these 10 sheep. Eventually they put them inside the ball so that the owner who's buying them has to break the ball open so that they couldn't like mess with the clay. I mean, it hardened, but sometimes they would try to find ways like any thief mm. will try to find a slick way to get around it, but there wasn't writing. It was like they were giving this, but does that mean that there wasn't some form of communication before language as we call it was on the scene and we just don't, we haven't found it yet or it's something out there. I mean, were the Sumerians, this is my real question, right? And it's a mystery. Uh, were they the real first people to come up with what we call writing? That doesn't mean we weren't sophisticated. I mean, look at all the massive ob objects you guys are talking about. Like what, how did we do this? How did we know to do this? We weren't like logistically. Yeah. Right. Like how would you, you, people would have to be 
ha have some sort of wage pay or even if, if it wasn't money they would have to have been paid in resources food um how do you source the food how do you make sure that people have like just the logistics of that yeah. kind of, like look at a festival like setting up fire festival all right look how like disastrous <laughs> that was can you imagine like who was the production planning team for Gobekli Tepe and Karen Tepe and all of that uh, logistics you'd have to have a way you can't have someone just taking a food order for 9,000 men without writing something down it would yeah maybe maybe the reason that we don't have records of writing before a certain period of time is because we've only found the stuff that's in stone or clay but right. if they wrote on anything else paper or leaves or anything else that's just gone poof into oh. history yep. um we haven't found it so I mean hmm. my other option I'm split with my theories I'm going to go a bit wild here but the theory of when we look at all the oldest stuff that's found in around the world egypt and wherever all of the really old builder type stuff is completely minimal it's completely clear there's no symbology on it there's no writing there's no inscription it's like super precise work which makes me think that maybe they didn't have writing so again you're like okay well what if you didn't have writing if there's no symbols did they communicate in another way? Was there another way to, because writing is to convey information. So I'm going on, what if there was a society or a way of life for humans where they had other communication skills that was not writing? If we had better memory, better ways to telepathically send messages and recordings or like like just thinking a little bit outside the box because um, I'm, I'm kind of leaning to maybe a hundred thousand years ago, humans had slightly different skills to us or there were hominids that exist that we don't know how that they look really freaking weird and they've got really weird heads and they've got craniums and like maybe they just had a different way and that's why all the old stuff isn't covered in writings and inscriptions and pictures because they didn't think like that or they didn't function like that it was all different strengths yeah like it... and you know like today you get um you get those sort of weird amazing freak people that have picture memories and they can memorize like pages and pages and pages of stuff or they can remember like number like i can i can remember like basically my phone number and that's it but but some people can just remember number There's plates this guy that uh did one helicopter uh flight above new york and then from memory drew the entire city skyline of new york things like just, that what, once. I went to high school with somebody who, we, we he, I mean, he was he was he had, he was a special needs um, person, but he would come to school every day and you'd ask him the score of the, of a game, any game, hockey yeah. game, baseball game, but he knew the exact score. He knew who scored. He knew who had the most assists. He knew who knew. Mm -hmm. He knew all all the stats. He remembered it by heart. He knew he knew how to remember numbers perfectly, but he had problems in other areas. Like he had, he was a slow talker. You know, but is he was it, this kid was a genius. So clearly. isn't yeah. this something, Johanna? You would be able to comment on this, and maybe both of you would actually. You mentioned Neanderthals, right? While well, we thought they were so dumb and whatnot, they may have been what maybe it's a horrible term to use this way, but autistic in some sense that they were very, very intelligent in certain ways, and kind of like we yeah. thought they were dumb because they weren't in other ways advanced, but they were very advanced in very focal points. Um, that's something you've mentioned, but I wanted to share, if I could, just this image right here. This book is a must read. It's a, it's a Dr. John Knight Lundwall and uh, mythos and cosmos mind and meaning in the oral age. So this gets to the heart of like one of the issues you could stop sharing. now. I just wanted to show it. Um, John Knight Lundwall points out that like people before writing, you were just describing it. We're way more advanced. It's like today asking your average Joe down the street, hey, so by the way, did you notice last night at the Pleiades that the Big Dipper was touching? What do you mean? No, I was watching Seinfeld on TV and I was writing a novel to my friend. Or No, you weren't watching the heavens. You weren't observing the stars. You weren't paying attention to the natural world the way they did in those days. So he had this really interesting hypothesis he brought out. And he said, before we had writing, we worked with the same hardware we've had for hundreds of thousands of years, but the software was different. Mm. We did not compartmentalize things the way we do now. Now we know how to separate ideas. Okay, you know, 
when Venus comes up, it's not really what causes the green grass and the trees and the birds and the bees and nature and all the green to come back. They used to believe and connect dots in ways we used to, we don't. Mm. They looked at Venus and they called it the morning, the bright morning star that brought life, the life bringer. Why? Every year at a certain time, if you observe the heavens, you'll notice this star comes up. And next thing you know, there's birds and bees and there's plants growing and flowers and life is coming. Fertility is happening. That God must have brought the power of life. So they connected things without compartmentalizing and going, oh, Venus is a planet. It's part mm -hmm. of the same solar system. It's just part of our sun and the sun gravitationally keeping it within yada, yada, yada. So he said when we got to writing, that did a lot of good in some ways, but also made us a little more disconnected from what we've been used to doing for hundreds of thousands of years. In the same way that we've had another jump now. So writing was one thing thousands of years ago. And now we've had like digital technology, which is again, Bingo. shifting our paradigm again. And we're now losing skills. I, I can't tell where to go. I have no sense of direction, no orienteering skills because I just, rely entirely on digital technology like even just driving i'm so bad at directions i'm like um yeah or like we get like my handwriting have you written physically written something down sometimes i go a long I time have. and then i write it and i'm like <laughs> oh like what is this writing this is rubbish so it's i think in some ways we're like gaining skills but then yeah. also we're like seriously losing them but i think that's what most people forget in the entire evolution of being a human and all the hominids and hominins that lived before us, when we acquire a new skill, we lose another. Mm. You can't keep acquiring skills because we, ah, hello, wow, mm. uh, we only use 10% of the brain. Right. Uh, I mean, I can do this, this is my 10%. If you put more into this, I will have to put out other stuff because it doesn't fit otherwise. I'm unable to acquire certain skills otherwise. So in order to grow and keep evolving as a species, yeah. we will keep losing other senses. So like I, I, one of the ways that, or like one of the very first conversations that you and I had uh, on Instagram in the DMs was me saying that with my ex, uh, while he was asleep, I would oh, yes. put my hand next to his face while he was very deep asleep like REM sleep he was gone he was out of it and he doesn't wake up from sounds or whatever but when i would put my hand next to his face he would wake up yeah because that's a, such a, an, an ancient response of like your safety your aura yeah. your space was invaded so like back in the day when we had to survive outside and we didn't have any homes having something invade your space and i think back then your space would have been a lot larger than it currently is mm. because we're very safe nowadays but when something invades your space you automatically wake up because you have to like keep yourself safe so wow. he would really wake up when i tried that and he would be very pissed and I'm like woman <laughs> what are you doing and i'm like yo i was just trying to i'm doing you know, an experiment dude but, Places like that you lose over time, it seems. Like, not everyone but that, has it. That's like a little, I think if, yeah, if we actually tra trapped and traced all these little weird little remnants and we think they're really normal or we just think that, oh, my person's special, he can remember, yeah. like, multiple numbers. And we're like, actually, this is just like echoes of old skills that we have. And that is some old yeah. brain thing that, yeah. you know, like your phone is always recording, ready for you to record. Yeah. Um, I think in the same way, our brain is always, even though when we're in a deep, deep sleep, there is some part of our brain that's still running just yeah. in case someone's like, gonna get you. You're there's, like, an, there's, <laughs> there's one interesting thing about this that I did not know that that makes a lot of sense with the idea of our evolutionary uh protection and survival uh is mm -hmm. all built into this but i didn't know this till someone who was talking about the philosophy of evolution and how we as humans have evolved they said you ever go to sleep and you feel like you're falling off the edge of a cliff and you you jerk you oh, yeah. you take a breath he, they said and this is their words not mine that that is actually a remnant in our evolution when we once lived in the canopy of trees five million years ago and we survived hanging on to the tree and once in a while we'd slip up and fall out of the tree and so there's a mechanism in us to pr protect ourselves wow. to wake up to grab to try and jerk to hold on before you fall the other point they brought up was 
notice as a child, you always think there's a monster under the bed. Because mm. when we lived in the canopy of the trees for millions of years, all of our enemies and monsters that wow. wanted to eat us were underneath us always. Wow. So subconsciously, it has been ingrained into our DNA. It has been part of our genetic development to survive. Yeah. And and I want to read one thing, if you don't mind. I'm sorry I'm hogging up. I just want to mention, this is Go so interesting. Yeah, sure. This is John Knight Lonewall's like, title for the book. A bold new approach. And I know Johanna loves the bold new approaches because she's always like, I think science is going to start changing. The paradigm shift is going to happen. A bold new approach to myth studies. Mythos and Cosmos re-examines ancient myth through the template of oral thinking and oral cosmology, contradicting decades of assumptions about the purpose and function of ancient mythology. Lundwall defines myth as the oral imprinting press of pre-literate peoples and shows that myth belongs to a complex and rational method of information transmission amongst oral peoples. Further, ancient mythology belonged to a cult, sorry, a cultus, which incorporated ritual and symbol in a cosmological system, which sought to found the sacred world. He not only does this in like ancient Hebraic studies and all the mythologies of like the Enuma Elish and Epic of Gilgamesh and Sumerian and Egyptian, you name it. He also works in America. So he's actually looking at the Native American carvings in Nevada and in Salt Lake City, and he's seeing how they also mapped out the stars and how that connected to their everyday lives and stuff. So I got to connect you guys, like for real. Every, everybody here. Yeah, I'm going to that book for sure because I think I'm, you know, I had a hunch, but I feel like that might be onto something that the ancient humans they just you just had a different tech, like, yeah. and we have little speckles of it today. You know, and we're like, mm. oh, that's weird that you text me. I was just thinking about you. Oh, weird. And then it's like, no, we're actually, you know, that was something that was very common. You could you could probably send people messages, thoughts, feelings, you know, dreams. Actually, I had a friend, and I totally believed them. They were a couple who they met in their dream. They had well, a dream. That's where they got they they um and they they described and they both described the exact same dream and they just saw it from the other point of view of each other and it was very weird um and yeah they could they this couple could meet in their dreams and i was like yeah really okay whatever yeah. but um but now i'm thinking about it i'm like i mean i guess it's not that it's just kind of consciousness and subconsciousness and maybe we don't we still don't know a lot about dreams like most scientists are like mm, we don't know why we dream it um dream. it's something that we all do and we all experience and we know it's something to the brain processing something and it's how we function but we don't really but know why the weirdest thing is that when you dream the 10 percent of the brain that you use while you're awake is shut down right because you don't use that part of because you're, you're oh, yeah. unconscious yeah your yeah. subconscious is only 10 percent of your brain but when you sleep, you're unconscious. So the ten percent that you normally use is just it's offline. shut down. It's offline. I think the only oh, times. I'm oh, sorry. I said it was like it's like sorting everything out and like. Yeah, like, yeah, it's filing it's like, stuff, but it's when weird. I was young, I I was really good at like remembering things. But if I had like a bad night's sleep, I couldn't remember anything. Yeah, like it was just complete mush inside my brain. So if I even as an adult, if I don't sleep at least six and a half hours i'm just completely effed so the past couple of nights i slept four and a half hours which was oh, fun well. so like my brain was completely fried at yeah. a wedding tipsy and everything no. but like i can feel in my brain that first of all you didn't have your right normal sleep second yeah. of all you've had alcohol third of all we didn't get to like put everything in storage where it should be normally yeah and I completely function on a different level. They they said it's that just survival. They did mechanism. A, a test between um, drunk people and new mums who aren't getting a lot of sleep, and they they tested them on um, car simulators, and they found that new mums were more dangerous than drunk people driving <laughs> oh. be because of lack of sleep because your <laughs> reaction speed is crap and yeah. you're like you literally you, you can't assess risks and you just simply don't see stuff you zone out like 
it's super dangerous so i yeah i can't function on no sleep i need a lot of sleep as yeah. well i think it's quite magic anybody that can just not I think there's we need it for a reason. We actually spend half our entire life just lying down, so like not conscious. It's quite weird. I'm like, weird does, is that a design flaw? Like fifty percent of our time no, I don't is like. I think it's a design flaw. I think just like, uh, look at your laptop or your phone. It can do so much. It's such a small device, and it can do so much. But if you don't charge it, it's not going to do anything. Right. And we're the same. We need to be charged. So mm -hmm. you need to have energy to put out energy. I think maybe they, that's why ancient people had spas like they were onto that right yeah they were like you got to recharge and all zen <laughs> you know and all your chakras in order right <laughs> you know what else i was thinking about is we think we're so advanced we know so much we're so much smarter than people from from the ancient world but that's if you took, if you took us right now and threw us back in time five thousand years and had us to try to survive with people living back then we would be completely lost we would be the, the lowest of the low in that society we that's a movie that i really want to see 95 percent of the people going back died within the first week like, yeah we, 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 we would not fire, be able to couldn't find water yeah. just yeah i think about that i think if there is another cataclysm like the one that happened ten thousand years ago yes um if there was another cataclysm how, how long would i last absolutely i think i'd last 24 hours i don't know where to get fresh water that doesn't come out of a tap i don't know where like what's safe to eat what bugs i can eat what like i don't know anything about survival how to hunt, how to hunt something i don't know how to hunt anything i'm a vegetarian i find yeah. that very morally hard i i'm fun. not built for the ancient life i mean i can build a fire just using wood but like See, it you're, takes you're, a you're really more advanced long than time. people you're, yeah, you're better off than most people are just, just, just by that. Um, most, most but like, can't do that. Even if I were to hunt and like I, 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 I killed something, then you need to still prepare it. And it's like, oh mm, no, <laughs> ah, no, nasty. <laughs> could, could you? Do you think you could hunt and kill something? They're American. Without without weapons, I mean, I like with your bare hand, could you snap an animal's neck with your bare hand? I try. I, I, I don't know. I doubt it. I Is think. I think when I you're hungry good. enough, yeah, I do. Um, I mean, this this gets into wh why I think religion came to be, like mm -hmm. all of this. Religion's not just order. It brings order. I mean, every myth, if you look at all the myths, Genesis, uh, the Enuma Elish, the Greek myths that I heard earlier tonight when I or earlier today when I interviewed uh, Demos, they all start off with this thing they call chaos. And they don't mean chaos and like what we think, oh, everything's just crap. But no, it's not a derogatory thing. It's disorder. There's no organization to anything. But gods or the god brings order. And if you look at it as a concept rather than an ontology where you have to believe there's really a guy behind the cloud sitting with a thunderbolt in his hand or Jesus is hiding behind a cloud watching you, whatever you're watching on the Internet, but some kid in Africa starving. No. Um if you look at it as a concept of fire, how does fire begin? Where did these ideas in water survival and all of these aspects, you can see how they would organize. And over a very long period of time, you would think these entities had almost an essence to themselves. That's why I love doing the religious stuff, because I think it's a key, like ancient mythologies and religions. Oh, you want to kiss me? Okay, dude. Okay. <laughs> uh but yeah, no, I think it's like a key in understanding our evolutionary process. Yeah. Whereas today, I I have an opinion on this. I think people are holding on to something that may not be necessary. We can create new models for. I still believe in myth. I love Iron Man. I love creating stories that tell us the most amazing things about us as humans. But they're all made in our image. You know, instead of pretending we're made in theirs, I think that we've made them in ours and i think we've advanced to that point so i think it's part of that whole when did fire come on the scene when did we learn how to roll the wheel all of that stuff probably plays a role in that significance so imagine know? invent the, like the, the guys and girls that invented fire like what oh, was like, going on so <laughs> like <we> know, dude <laughs> homo erectus was like the first human that like controlled fire for sure that we know of and we found evidence of like fire being used uh, between 1.4 and 1.9 million years ago. Wow. Being controlled. 
So they, they had to have magical powers prior before, like 2.4 million years ago, wow. 2.8 million years ago. There are some remnants of fire. It's just that we cannot confirm nor deny that those fires were being controlled right. or being taken advantage of because they yeah. started naturally. We right. don't know mm -hmm. that. But <laughs> when we look at like this human evolutionary timeline from when we, as the homo genus started, we started when the Australopithecines evolved and we started with Homo habilis. Mm. And then there are some anthropologists that say that, you know, Homo habilis should actually be an Australopithecine because they were. I don't know what, what any of like, these. Like, uh... <laughs> <laughs> I'm just they like, were right, like yeah. the very, very, very first in the homo genus. They okay. were the first humans. Like the granddaddy yes. of all granddaddies. Okay. Yes. So, but then like, I, I just made this video. I, it's not yet up, but it's going to be up tomorrow. But I looked into like the oldest stone tools. They predate humans. They predate all humans. The oldest stone tools that we've discovered are like 3.3 million years old. Wow. Mm -hmm. And they were being created by an Australopithecus genus. Right. So the pre humans. Pre human. Yeah. So. Omen, but not human. Mm -hmm. And that to me is insane. Like the Stone Age started before humans even existed. We used yeah. to think that the Stone Age started with humans. Us. Yeah. But no. Homo sapiens inherited these tools. Yeah. yeah. But wow, that's it just we just progressed it. We just went yeah. a little further than our parents, right? Yeah. You know, and you know their parents. I, and... You know what else I thought was pretty interesting? You're since your dog's on screen, I thought of um, Gutsick Gibbon made a video about how dogs actually affected the human evolution timeline, and not only did they help us evolve, we we changed their evolutionary path too. Yeah. So dogs, dogs and humans have like an intertwined evolutionary path. That? I think she says something about, and this is not just her, like she's relying on the field of all the scholars out there that talk about this, something about us and our hand-eye coordination that made us go beyond the other species that went extinct. And having dogs with their keen sense and their capabilities that we don't have, being the best friend of man, like helped us hone in on those skills, which made us just go even further. And I don't know how long ago, I couldn't put dates on it, maybe you know, um, how long ago man has used dogs or wolves, really, that end up becoming domesticated because that's where they come from. Mm. I'm seeing 40 million years ago from a quick Google search. I mean, 4 million? 40 million. 40 million. We've 40 been having pets for 40 million years. So that means that way before even the Australopithecus. Right. That's so some monkey form of us is yeah. like hanging out with dogs literally love it and, this, and it says that there's still a scholarly debate going on right now as of whether we found them or they found us so, so i think he's saying that uh he i found us. you right. punk but can you imagine that being like a, a hominoid a humanoid and dogs are like coming up to you being friendly like hey let's like you just sort yeah. of sense it you know what i mean like and other animals do that too. There's actually there's actually examples of other animals in in the wild who get together and have friendly relationships and live together. And they're not really, different. yeah, like different birds and stuff like that. Imagine if it had evolved the other way, and so a monkey and a dog became friends, and eventually now we've got pet dogs. But what if it went the other way, and the dogs were in charge, and we just had the pet oh, humans? No, like, You're making me think of. Uh, I'm his pet. I think. Yeah. That's what is that? What is that movie? Um, Family Guy did that. What's that movie with the the uh, Planet of the Apes? You know how the yeah. apes are <laughs> ruling the humans and stuff. It's like, whoa, hold on, what? I mean, uh, yeah, maybe in some parallel dimension. Um, just going back, I literally just read in a book yesterday about the origin of the oral tradition of the origin of religion in Egypt and how the priesthood even started so like why how did we get to a place where there was this hierarchy of because originally in Kemet in Egypt before Egypt was Egypt there wasn't everybody was equal there was no uh nobody having any kind of gatekeeping or access everybody was taught the same thing and everybody there's there's something like in the oral tradition they said there's like 360 which is interesting because of the 360 degrees and everything. There's 360 netters, which means like it translates to like energies or powers. 
So um, humans have access, like we have, it, well, the old humans had access to use these energies, these powers. Um, and interesting, the translation for a pyramid, the pyramid is a Greek translation. The original word is per netta, which means house of energy. Mm. So mm. they had a thing that humans could have all these like 360 of like access to energies that, that basically all of existence, all matter, all conscience is connected. And that's what they thought. And so you could access these things. You could heal yourself. You could, um, I mean, I don't know, maybe get to some sort of psychological plane of whatever. That, that healing yourself. It's like uh, what cats do. When cats uh, are hurt or they don't feel good, they, they start purring. Yeah. And the frequency of the fur can actually heal like broken bones and stuff. Well, there we are. Um, and, and humans had an element of that as well. They could work with frequencies and they could connect to these like chakras and stuff. And But they said, but what happened was um, when people were getting uh, populated, the priesthood, it's people started to uh, basically not follow. They, they weren't as interested to do that whole process of getting connected with the universe and getting connected to the earth and the energies. And that kind of fell out of fashion and people got more into I don't know whatever other hobbies they had and only uh so then then the, just a select number of men and women the priest and priestesses they were the ones that did like the old way and they were the ones that could still connect and it basically became the holy of the original holy of holies were located at specific points in the in in the in the temples which were right. built on very specific ley lines of energies so people would come to the temple to connect to the you know all of the I netters had I had a scholar on um, Grabby. That, that's how you say his name, Grabby, uh, Derek? Dr. Uh, Grabby. Grady, Grady, Grady. Grady. And he Grady. was saying exactly what you said. He said that the Jerusalem temple, the way the structure is laid out, is based off the older Egyptian temples of like Heliopolis and yes. Luxor. And they had the same layout. Like the, the, it's like a square within a square in the middle, the Holy of Holies. He said that's an Everything, ancient, that's an yeah, ancient it's, world in temples. The sites are specifically built where they are because of the um, the energies of where they are. They're like hot spots for 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 energies, and um, and so the holy of holies. So they basically this priesthood started started gatekeeping because they were the only ones after a few generations that could remember how to meditate to get to that place, how to access the netters, and they started becoming so people normal people were then outside the walls of the sanctuaries, whereas before thousands of years before anybody could walk in anywhere and it was like it, everybody was kind of equal and then so started this kind of basically religion where you would have people saying well if you want this if you want to get inner peace if you want to touch the gods if you want to be connected to the universe you have to go through me because i'm the only one that knows how to access or how to like ignite right. this holy of holies it seems like there was a time where we developed ego yeah something there was like a disconnect because happened when people well, I mean, we have extremely rich people and we have the majority of the world, which is like either normal or poor. But yeah. it's, it's the ego that made them eventually the extremely rich. Yeah. yeah. And the normal and the poor people, like, to be completely honest, I grew up extremely poor and I've never met more generous people than my immediate family poor who people. was extremely poor because yeah. we knew yeah. how hard it was. So we always gave away. And yeah. then you had like the rich people in my family because I had rich people in my family and they never gave anything to anyone, right. not even for a birthday. They didn't even do birthday presents. Oh, wow. That's they were that kind of like, no, that's their money. You know, yeah. like, like you have more than enough and you don't even want to give a little bit while someone who has absolutely nothing gives everything they have. And that's the story there as well in all the ancient texts it seems to be in quite a lot of places that story of like the corruption of mankind yeah. meant they turned away at once we were at one with nature i mean it's it's kind of said in different ways in different texts and in different mm -hmm. cultures but it's kind of telling the same story again and again we, developed ego. we were we were in connection with yeah. with conscience and everything and then we kind of fell out of it some people still could therefore they monetized that at some point and they became there's like a hierarchy evolved where really nobody should have there shouldn't be a hierarchy no. like that the, if you're if you're a citizen of the earth if you're a human being on earth you should be able to access all the energies all of the yeah. benefits all the nutrients just like that um all those the henges the hench monuments here in the uk the united kingdom we have uh, stones of stenness it's a hench monument who built it 
well, we think we know that there were Neolithic farmers or whatever, but why and for who? And then people think, yeah, but they built it probably for like a Druid or a priest or whatever. No, they built it together mm. because that was an important area for them and they wanted something to make it even more monumental. And then you have the immediate area. The pyramids of Giza, uh, of Giza are like the stars of Orion. Yep. Orion's belt. But what people don't know is that the Ring of Bukhan, the Ring of Brodgar, and the Stones of Stenes are in the same fashion. Mm. They're in the belt of Orion. No one knows this, and this predates the pyramids by two, three, three thousand years. This it's gets back to that whole orality thing that I was saying. Like they're connecting yeah. heaven and earth. We know on our yeah. on earth as it is in heaven, Jesus prayed, but also that idea of as above, so below, ancient concept. There's one thing I wanted to mention. Like take a take a airplane ride with me, a satellite view of the whole picture. I love the way you're painting this because it's making me think big picture. Um, the ancients were, you know, they. They ran with a caste system. What made that development begin? Like, why is it there's a hierarchy and only the elites at the top know the secrets and the wisdom and all the truth? What's before that? And I think that's what Johanna's trying to reach back to. Yeah. But what gets me is over time and developments happen throughout the different various religions, Greco-Roman, then you get into the New Testament, these mysteries that only the elite, the elite are allowed to know. Why? Because knowledge is power. Wisdom is power. And they recognize probably absolute power corrupts absolutely because it's common sense. So if you give people these insights and they're not prepared, or they have a corrupt or evil sense about them in their view, they're probably thinking these people are going to do damage. We need initiates who can go through all the processes and be prepared to handle the knowledge we're going to give and use it for good rather than for evil. So I think that development happened and you brought up the the whole 360 energies, however you want to interpret it. I'm not an expert. I don't know what this really means, but I see something here. And I brought an image up. Can you share this image real quick, oh, sure. uh, Neil? Go for it. This right here is a man named Honi, a Jewish, very uh, charismatic uh, preacher in the first century at the same time around when Jesus was on the scene. They called him the circle drawer. Because the power was in this 360 circle that he would draw on the ground. And he had a following. I don't even know what he taught. I haven't even dug into Honey yet. But I know some of the academics I've talked to say this is their favorite figure around this time period. He would draw circles. I don't know what he taught about it. But that 360 and there's there's this concept. Yeah. Who knows? The 360. And then when you look at the, um, yeah, like the, the 360 you're talking about, like literally the earth. 360 yeah. degrees of the earth and it's, it's it's weird that there's 360 energies one of them sorry my dog has got into a very loud bone um <laughs> <laughs> that so the oral tradition around the sphinx not the current sphinx that's sculpted today but the rock that the sphinx i'm taking this obi stop it i'm talking about the sphinx um the, the rock that the sphinx was carved from is on a extremely high energy point and apparently like oral tradition of egypt was that oh my god i tried giving him another bone and it didn't that work we'll take that away uh that the thousands of people would come to the rock from like fifty thousand years ago because this area was a place where you could access the netter the energy and you could access your netters and you could come for healing or for knowledge or for whatever what it was so the air that rock that the sphinx is carved from is very special to the oral tradition of the indigenous people of egypt not so much the shape of the sphinx now but um the actual like location of it was had some functional purpose for um them and the netters and yeah it's super, it's super interesting and like now we don't have access to that kind of stuff and i mean i maybe in a, some way some people when they say like meditation or people can have they you know when you can meditate to a point where people have almost psychedelic experiences mm -hmm. um and there's like the conscious the, the theory that everything in the universe is all we are all one conscious the full quote i read the full quote the other day it says as above so below and it's like as within so so, without. so yeah. without and and oh it was the last bit um as with the earth so with the soul so it's like 
the physical earth, it's also your soul, which is the non-physical part of you. Like it's all connected, your conscious mm. and all the matter we're all like, and it sounds super hippie but well it's no but real. like when you look at like what um so I, I i like the universe a lot and i used to watch a lot of documentaries about the universe because i'm a weird thing yeah uh, i also like <laughs> the body like the human body but when you look at like our blood vessels and you look at like leaves or oh, nature system yes. of like how the water travels in the veins of a leaf a it's lung, the exact yeah. same lung is a tree and a tree makes the oxygen that you breathe in your lungs it's like exactly. but <laughs> there's like, a design plan here we have the universe and we have all these galaxies and we look at like our brains from like a neurosurgeon's perspective and how these neurons in the brain fire information towards each other and mm. it's just like the universe yeah it's we are the universe and we live in the universe as well. It's like, it's you know, all connected. This is beautiful. The other. I love what you're saying here. This is beautiful because this connects the problem that I deal with from people who believe in God and don't. And mm -hmm. what I mean is the answer is true for both positions. Yeah. If you ask mm -hmm. Neil deGrasse Tyson, right, who doesn't believe in God, he says, no, you are the stars. We're made of them. Like we are all yeah. one in this thing. And if you ask someone who believes, they'll say, this is evidence of creator. Like they, they use this evidence to point that they have a creator. To someone who doesn't like Neil deGrasse Tyson or someone like me who's a skeptic, it still makes the value and appreciation of what we live in, what this is, whatever this is that we live in, which we don't really know, no matter how much we want to touch it, like the blind yeah. men and the elephant and explain what this existence is. Um, it just makes it beautiful. Can I and give you, don't, you a yeah. different perspective on like religion from like a Dutch person's perspective? Because um, we have a lot of people who are like agnostic in the world because mm -hmm. they believe in something, but they don't know what. The Dutch went a step further. We developed itsism. So our, most of the atheists in the Netherlands aren't actual atheists, but they're itsists. What's it? It's, it's is the Dutch word for something. Oh, so in, like agnostic. Like agnostic, but then a step further. So it's like somethingism. Okay. So that's a Dutch thing. We believe that there is something, but we with the agnostic people, they even have their own societies and they've made it into a religion. Mm. The Dutch don't like that. 80% of the people in the Netherlands are atheists, itsisms. Because we believe in something, we don't want to give it a name, we I don't want to give it a word, we just want to be good people, good to ourselves, good to others, and make sure that we don't bring any harm. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's itsism. Right. Just, but there is something more than it's we can see. <laughs> like because yeah. we, we breathe air, yeah. but we don't see air. So who's like to say that air doesn't exist or it does? It's like a so form of deism. We to basically. say that there's something or not. You know, you know, you know what deism is? It's like a, it's the yeah. idea that there was something that's created the universe, but doesn't exactly influence anything. Doesn't exactly get get its hands involved. Just sparks it off, starts evolution, and then kind of backs off and you know sort of does. Yeah, itself. that's it's no science, science project for God, technically. But, but yeah, I, I wanted to mention something about about what you said about the guy with the circles in the first century. Yeah, there was another genius named Archimedes. He was a from Sicily, and he was one of the Carthaginians. That was um, Hannibal was using him. It was like he was like the uh, Einstein of the time period, the 300s BC or no, 200s BC. And uh, he was such a genius that the Romans uh, ordered the um, the troops that they found him. Do not kill him. Bring him back. We need him. He's the most important human being on the planet. And so when they found one of the Roman soldiers wasn't paying attention, they found him in the sand drawing circles like he was obsessed with circles. And the guy, the guy killed him. When they found the body and they saw the circles, they knew it was him because they knew he was obsessed with drawing circles. And that's how he died. But he was a genius. Um, I thought that was interesting that he mentioned the guy in the first century was doing the same thing. That's a, there's some, probably something going on there. But yeah. um, you are a remnant but, of Pythagoreanism or something. Yeah, you know? something like that. But even but, then, um, circles. Like, look at the hench monuments that they used to create. They were circles. Circles, circles yeah. yeah. They the were circles. Um, <laughs> also... <laughs> 
actually, I'm just, I, I realized I lied earlier when I said that the ancient builders were all precise with no inscriptions or no imagery. There is an argument that actually there was one symbol and one symbol alone that could have been from the previous version, and that is a circle. There's um, on some of the old granite, huge granite box things, um, you can see where they, the Egyptians have come later and, and carved in beautiful uh, hieroglyphs. But there's one which is like a circle, which is quite deep in there and it's polished like the rest of the granite because Egyptians didn't know how to polish granite potentially. Um, well, they didn't anyway with their, their hieroglyphs. Like all the hieroglyphs are like rough on the stone, but the original stone box is like polished with some crazy they still don't they can't work out how they but did like, it the circle symbolism predates yeah so far yeah, i think back. circle is like the oldest symbol out of all the symbols that we can draw and it's potentially the only thing that is inscribed on the super ancient structures in the world is this kind of like circle embossed thing like um newgrange and noth in ireland i know that megalithic artwork which is like from 3000 BCE, so it's like 5000 years old. There's a lot of circles yeah. and circle symbolism. And I mean, the I, first I, window was circular in Karen Tepe. Like, I'm still yeah. trying to. Do you know that, you know that Thoth <laughs> in the uh, Egyptian Book of the Dead? It says that Thoth invents writing, mm -hmm. which, is, which actually lines up with Hermes and Greeks being the inventor of writing and all that stuff. But, anyways, they said that Thoth hated it because he knew that it would make mankind dumber. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was like, I invented this writing thing. Yeah. I don't want to give it to them because if they get it, they're going to, they're going to, they're going to forget things. They're going to be. And Taoism oh. as well. Don't want you to write it down. Like they're like, they don't like writing. Taoism was all about oral traditions and right. mental remembering and memorizing. And yeah, in Taoism, I like literally the beginning of the quote is like, if you have to write it down, then it's same with the Celts. It exist or something. Same with the Celts. The Celts never had any writing system. Yeah. Why we barely know anything about the Celts. Yeah, they didn't write anything down. They didn't write, they refused to create a writing system. But the Vikings and the people living in Ireland, they they developed uh Ogham script. And that's like there is. It's oh, extremely Ogham script is like predating the Viking runes. Yeah. But no one knows where it came from or where it went, and it's not Celtic, and it was just there. It's super weird. It is in, in, weird. Interesting thing about this whole going into writing that John Knight Lunwell talks about, and I've done a few episodes with him, is that before they did writing, they danced and sang these rituals that they had as myths. And when writing came on the scene, there was this transition happening where if you go like to the oldest we know of in Africa, these tribes that still have this remnant, they're dancing in circles. By the way, the mm -hmm. women are the circle made. So the women are literally seated as a circle and the men go around them to impress them. What guy doesn't do that today? You know, she's there, lift that log, lift that log. You got it. You know, like, and they're dancing and like, whichever they even have tribes, like the whitest teeth, you know, in Africa, like whoever's the whitest teeth, things like that. But you dance around the women and try to impress them and, and do it in a ritual sense where it wasn't just dancing. Like today we go to a club to dance. It was everything in one. I just pictured and, Eric trying to lift a log and actually was like, Johanna's there. Hey, Johanna. Hoist. Yeah, yeah, no, but seriously, the, the that transition is what I think that they lost. And this is what John Knight, Lone, John Knight Lunwall was saying some of the texts in the Bible look like they're poetic and they're meant to be danced and sang as a ritual rather than just read out loud. Oh, okay. And Genesis chapter one at Sunday school. The no. Psalms, the Psalms, are, the Psalms the Jewish, they sing all of the Torah. Yeah. The Psalms that are written are supposed to be for music. Like it even says in the, in the Hebrew versions, like David, the Psalmist and the heart has the harp for this one. Pull out the harp for this one. Pull out the flute for this one. Like it tells you how to do it and everything. Sorry, dog. my my dog's trying to say he he steals his bed and then he tries to shag it. It's really embarrassing. Sorry. Yeah. Um, this this is gonna this is gonna get graphic. I'm gonna get the dog off. We may fire. have learned that from so, the dogs. Actually. I mean, right, right. Yeah. You know what I thought about too is we, we were talking about how we get these caste systems over time and how like. 
we become more like elitist and sort of violent and become like we lose our like ability to just be like you know kind to everybody and mm. equality and all that stuff and i was t and i keep bringing up guts of given but i thought about this and i had her on my channel she told me something that was mind-blowing about evolution and that when you go back far enough before weapons were being made there was matriarchal um systems of human different humanoids where they the lead the leading member of the society was the oldest grandmother. Mm. They, were, they were called grandmother societies where the, the head of the, ho the head honcho of the society was the oldest woman. For whatever I reason, the women were the highest of the hierarchy. And it wasn't until weapons started being made where men sort of took over because now we have a need for armies, a need for conquering, a need for war. And that was the most profitable thing is to go and sack another country and take all their stuff. So when that happened, that's when... That's when patriarchy became a thing because men, that, that was when men took over. The interesting yeah. thing you're saying is, and it's going to sound common to us because women have babies all the time, right? Okay. But when you think about it, all the goddesses that were worshipped, Anat, Asherah, you name it, that goes back, gods, wives, and all that stuff. Asshole. The fact in the ancient world that women could produce a life like that, was you know, like, they yeah. are a goddess that you had Respect. divine powers that we don't Magic. have. You had magic, magic that we didn't have. Yeah. It's That's like, why it makes sense that the women would be in top of the of the hierarchy. Before. They were on a pedestal. Yeah. Men yeah. treated them better. And I then did a video on this. this. I did it like a small video talking about the matriarchal system in ancient civilizations. It did not go down well with the, uh, particularly the men of America. They did not like that. Um, I was like, hey, it's, I didn't make it up. It's, it's actually what the oral. <laughs> you don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, they were like, "Well, you should just go make a sandwich." I was like, what? "Oh <laughs> like, my!" Was like, oh, they were like, "Well," we, and then the, and then they then they tried to say that the Egyptians they were like, "Well, see, that's why the Egyptians um like ended because women run them." I was like, "No, the Egyptians ended actually when the men took over." So you actually just ate your oh, own thing. Um, gosh. but but it, it was you know it's the same with like Judaism runs down the the woman's line. You're, you're only a Jew if you're born from a female Jew, like right. technically. Yeah. And, um, it's the same with the Egyptians that the, when the first wife didn't produce a son, her daughter would marry the firstborn son of a lesser wife to keep the bloodline pure. Because it's yep. It has and, to be... And in Judaism, uh, uh, yeah. a male can be 100% Jewish. If he has a woman, if he, if he has a wife who's not Jewish, the son is not considered to be a Jew. It be yeah, it has to be a from mother, the mother. Right. The mother has to be. Which is, which is kind of like, yeah, it's like echoes of what, what the ancient civilization and how, I mean, they just super respected the moms, really. Like, it is magic. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's, I mean, they're it's, not it's, making it's, good sandwiches anyway. So why are we, you know. I was like, mate, you don't want me to make you a sandwich. <laughs> you want to be good. Like, I'm just teasing. It's, yeah, but it, did, it was just interesting how, yeah, it did not go down well. It was extremely threatening. I was like, that's interesting that you find that threatening. And, like, like yeah, like and the fact that Asherah right. and other female gods are, like, really erased from the Bible. Mm -hmm. um, anything that Mary Magdalene did or, you know, if she was preaching, that sort of swept away as well. And it was exactly. like, it's, it's kind of sad that uh, if you can just try and look at it from a non-emotional place, like, that's just what it was. Demeter mm. is the most important god in Greek mythology. Going the farther back you go, D Demeter's nickname is Holy Dio, Holy God. Like she was the 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 illusionating illusionary mysteries were mm -hmm. all around her. She was the savior. She's the one who goes down and saves Persephone from Hades. She's the one that everybody is giving offerings to during the festivals. And like that was the that was like the the pinnacle of their of their worship. And then all of a sudden, it's like, oh, now Zeus is the thing. But Demeter goes back farther than Zeus. I just remembered as well recently one of the one of like the top brain um, kind of experts in the world. He did a video I saw on Instagram, and he said it was really interesting after all these years studying the human brain from the different sexes. Um, he goes, interestingly, the female brain it's really wired for um it's got a lot of leadership skills in the way that the female brain is wired you're good in an emergency you're good at like logistics you're good at democracy you're good at like planning and delivering orders and the male brain is excellent at executing production execute but you're physically bigger you right. are supposed to be you are the, like 
it's really weird how we've kind of reversed it slightly in the um in in our culture and that's true couple, even in my years. own marriage though you're 100 right like i know for a fact physically i could kick someone's you know what better than my wife okay yeah but she i'm afraid of her when she gets like i mean it's just it doesn't matter how big and how bad it's like no she's big and bad like i'm not messing with her and i'm not kidding there's something like you're describing here where i can i can execute things like like a militant monster when it gets to stuff getting done i can do it yeah. but she knows how to do things i can't even begin to comprehend i can't even begin yeah, it's it's interesting that this brain specialist, a male brain specialist, was saying this is the data that we looked at from a scientific point of view. We're taking out the politics, we're taking out of all the gender politics. We're right. just looking at the facts here, and we're going. Interestingly, women's brains are very good at wiring for this. They're very good with the communications. They're very good at like we have certain skills. Like when there's a problem, when we have emotional stuff, we as a women, we immediately connect. We work it out, mm. we cry it out, we know how to access the, we're allowed to access the full range of emotions, the process stuff, very diplomatic. A lot of the countries that are run by females, if you look at the economics in that country, they make, look at New Zealand. They make some very good decisions. New and Zealand is doing really like economically, good. There's, yeah, some, there's, some, yeah. there's some stuff to support what he's saying. And yeah. then, and it does make sense. I'm like, yeah, so like men are literally, you, you are, you are the power force. But also, so men, don't like to ask for help. This mm -hmm. is no. But a woman, me as a woman alone, I'm traveling alone at the moment in a different country. I speak a different language naturally. Mm -hmm. I step into a bar. The first time I was here in November, my first night in London, I had a massive panic attack. I had no idea what I was going through. And the next day I was going to meet you. I was not doing well. I stumbled into like a pub. And the first thing I saw was a waitress looked me dead in the eye and she said, you're not okay. You come with me. She sat me down at a table, gave me five minutes to breathe. And she was like, okay, I just saw from your face, you're having a panic attack. I knew I needed to sit you down. You're good. She had the I'm skills. I'm take care of you. But she already knew I needed help before I was even at the point of asking for it. Men don't do that no yeah if that if she, if that wasn't a female waitress if that was a male waiter that would have gone down completely yeah. different because she knows that as a woman on an emotional level you need to take care of other people make sure that they're good well that's men doesn't have that in that sense. well something to be fair some every do, everyone's on a science scale and there are some yeah. men who are amazing at delegating and there are some yeah. men so it, it is a science scale, but they were saying in general this is we're, we're kind of given a slightly different skill set that when they use together it's like team but you know and, what i noticed about that is that in the ancients in the ancient text the ancient scriptures in hebrew in the bible hakma is, is the word for wisdom it's a female word in the bible the word wisdom is always use in the sense of females yeah wisdom her holy wisdom is it's always her it never is him the and holy even, spirit even is... in Greek mythology yeah uh, sophia. sophia was the goddess of wisdom so wisdom was and by the ancients wisdom was always seen as a feminine thing mm. also interestingly everybody i know who's had a, a psychedelic experience and they've done ayahuasca or lsd or anything like that when they meet the great conscience of the like the consciousness of the the world and the earth and the universe um always they always sort of recognize it as a female they, i've heard it so many times now they've gone I, I like i just had a feeling that this thing was like feminine that it was female i don't know why but like i met conscious and it was feminine and i've had so many people say that um regardless of whatever gender they are like that was just it was kind of it's like a repeated um you, experience i've seen so many people have if i may bring just to throw this out there i'm guessing here maybe you you might think I, i'm onto something or not but if we were to try and approach this scientifically like what you're describing here and we got rid of potential spirituality or trying to describe this in vague terms mm -hmm. okay we're we're all born from a woman we like our existence is threaded through a female like it's everything worse it's even worse. Why do you men have nipples when they don't have boobs? Right, right. Because they started Who as says every, I don't everyone's have boobs. female. No. At, at, at like six, seven, eight weeks of age in your mom's womb is when your gender is actually coming out. So as a boy, around six, seven weeks of age, your gender starts to turn into the male gender. But we all started as, as female. female. 
That's why yeah. uh, the reproduction system of the male and female are actually extremely similar. It's just that with the male, it's outwards and with the female, it's inwards. Wow. But they just now, like a couple of years ago, they finally figured out what exactly the female rep reproduction system looked like because they had no idea yeah. it wasn't in it wasn't in a medical the gray's anatomy yeah. medical textbook in like 2005 or something they still hadn't wow. like yeah. they still hadn't mapped yeah. the whole female so version we know that because we all started as the same female gender that's also probably why everything when you go back far enough like ancient civilizations yeah. why they always worshipped the females can because we, we tell, all started out female. Can we tell all those American men to go make themselves a sandwich at this point? I mean, it seems, <laughs> I mean, you, know? you could ask them to like, if you really don't believe all of this, then please get rid of your nipples. <laughs> or they deserve them more nipples. Also, weirdly, there's some stuff I just love having this conversation with people because so much of what we think about you know, men and women and stuff, it's actually just really recent social stuff, like the color blue and pink. That was reversed in the 20s. Before the 20s, the color blue was a little girl's color and yeah. the color pink was a little boy's color. And then they wow. a fashion house, I think New York, I think Macy's, they did a catalog and they swapped it to be like, make this big fashion move. And then we just adopted it. So wow. yeah. you, the reason why you have a white wedding dress, it's literally only traditional from 1850 or some 1830 because uh, Queen Victoria in England wore a white wedding dress, which was like, whoa, normally you'd wear a color, you'd wear a blue or a gold or a red or whatever. She wore a white one and then it just stuck. And now everybody just wears a white wedding dress all over the world, when well, like the Western culture, yeah. because of uh, Queen one Victoria. Yeah. And, wow. and, and, and I'm like, that's so weird that tradition, well, we, we kind of stick to it. Again, Why women give birth lying on their backs? Because it's all the reason because this one French king wanted to see the baby come out that way yeah he had a kink and he wanted to what he he he, he made all the um his like wives, women yeah. wives he made them give birth lying down which actually is the like the, the not the, the best way at all way, worst way possible really? you should, you should you give should birth gravity. you should be squatting and sitting because gravity will pull the baby out yeah. a lot quicker lying down is probably one of the most painful and you're, yeah. you're trying the baby's trying to come out this way rather than down so yeah. but uh, hands and knees or squatting yeah Oh, is like the best I know that. That's interesting. Position. I know it's like facts. That's but why so many babies are born during the car ride towards the hospital because the woman is sitting and gravity is just making it come out instead of lying big. on her back. It makes me, and this is gonna. <laughs> I don't know why I'm even saying this. This is crazy. Uh, when did we start sitting to poop? Because it's yeah. much healthier to squat well, with your knees to your chest. Yeah. When did that happen? You know, I think it was a money thing. I think they were like, we're going to invent this seat and it's going to be, we're like, <laughs> it, yeah, you know, we're going to have a bit like, but actually they didn't realize that it was the harder way to poop. And um, it's probably not been great for colons for centuries, no. but um, <laughs> high heels were originally for men. They were designed for men. What they were, they were, they were a status cool. thing in like, uh, look at pirate shoes. Um, look at um, all of the men of the court in the 1700s. Yeah. You wouldn't be seen dead at court without a full wig of hair, weave like down oh, to yeah. here. Dang, that's you good would point. have had high that's heel like court shoes. Women wouldn't wear them. The men wore them because it was again, like a status thing and um, full face of makeup. The men wore, you'd yeah. powder your face, you'd rouge, you'd lipstick, you'd do a dot. Like, look at George Washington. And then all oh, these exactly. Americans were like, no oh, blaspheme George Washington. Yes. So <laughs> like the manliest men had the most rouge. They right. had the biggest hair. They had the highest heels. And so it's only a really relatively recent thing that it's trans that women have kind of taken over the fashion and we've kind of nicked it. But really it was a men thing. And um, only recently, like all, whatever, whether you're a boy or you're a girl, all little kids wore dresses. And then yeah. it was a thing about four or five years old, you'd have like, you'd kind of, you'd trouser your boy and because they weren't a baby anymore, but dresses are the easiest thing to like change nappies and help people, kids pee and stuff and teach them how to pee. So like little boys wearing dresses, again, it's only a super recent thing that's that's become like a bit like, you can't wear that. I was like, well, why? It's a, it's a, it's a people wearing tunics and it's kilts. Fabric. And yeah, I was gonna say, the design of a dress wasn't uh, to do with the gender. Right. The and warrior, so look at the ancient warriors. They had these kilts. They're wearing basically a skirt. 
I mean, that's exactly. what it was, you know? Exactly. Um, I mean, I remember when I, I was like the Scots for this. The kilts. Reason. Yeah. The kilts and like, they're so manly. They are. And they have like a skirt on and I'm like, oh, yes, yeah. there's, like there's something about a man <laughs> in a skirt. It's just brilliant. You're just yeah. like, yeah, you can see the legs. With the oh, I got a, I got an oh. image of a Roman warrior. So this is Good not, even, this is not even Scottish. This is a just Roman. Thing. Yeah, I just yeah. love it when anyone's trying to get in an argument with me about like cultural per, of 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 stuff like that. I'm like, but do you know that the color is like yeah. so recent? It's less than a hundred years, dude. Like, right. don't be married to that idea because it's gonna change. Right. I need to add this right now. It's pretty. You got a picture of that Roman warrior? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. What yeah. a man. Yeah. Look at that dress. Oh, that yeah. Mm -hmm. I dropped it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You can't yeah. get better than a man's thigh. <laughs> that 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 fashion, they, you, they don't show the thighs off enough for yeah. me. So no. there we are. Look at that. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Yep. I think the uh, the shield, uh, you know, caps it off. The giant the shield. Shield. Oh, can you imagine, like, <laughs> you need a pee. Like, Mick, can you hold my shield? Sorry. <laughs> I just really need to pay. Can you just you can hold this, please? <laughs> oh my gosh! Yeah. Well, again, I just love the idea of working out the first person who invented that fighting was way safer if you hid behind something, <laughs> being like, "This is really useful." Oh, this is like oh that meme I shared a while ago on Twitter, like a Neanderthal and another Neanderthal that was gonna eat like a mushroom or something, and then he had like this sort of notepad. <laughs> and to see if like if he died or not yeah the other guy eating the mushroom to know if it's safe or not yeah you eat it first dude you, you eat, eat it, it you first. Eat it. if you die then we know okay that's not no no eating <laughs> we learned that you died oh my gosh yeah that's a whole nother discussion honestly yeah. Just yeah, like, what happened with the psychedelics and stuff i mean ah yeah. but i thought it was just interesting if if i could just one last thing i'd love to poke on that is we are all threaded in a woman and it's also the mother that we've like her voice, her existence is all we know. And I imagine that that would be the most primitive in your brain thing that would be instilled. So if you are going back, assuming these psychedelics that you ingest, take you down to the brain stem where your core existence is, where your primordial. Ancient brain. Of, yeah. Like where you are at your base, you're going to meet what is your base. And that would be your mother in a way mm -hmm. yeah. and so and this goes back to gaia you know the the divine earth and, and like it just makes you kind of wonder like hmm lots of questions lots of cool stuff to look into do you know we we're also i think it only applies to girls but we were also carried by our grandma yeah yeah uh the eggs of a woman are developed while she is a baby she has all the, the eggs as her mom. Yeah. Wow. Oh, wow. So my mom had all her eggs already created while she was still being carried by my grandma. And unfortunately, I'm not going to give that. I'm, I'm not going to continue the line. I'm unable to have kids. That's all, all right. But my sisters have kids of their own. And my oldest sister has a daughter. And we know that she was already being carried by my mom back in the day. Yeah, that's it's mad. So you yeah, like as a the egg that made me was in my grandma. Yeah, it's super wow. weird when you think about it. But that's that does for me explain why I have green eyes because my grandma is the only other person in both my sides of the family with green eyes, and I have green eyes. So it's come through your mother's line. Yeah, but it's madness. It is madness. Yeah, it is fascinating. Got the female line. Actually, I found about female lines. My I'll close with this. I did a DNA test um, that 23 and me and found out that uh, I'm 0.2 percent North African. Wow, Great. nice. So nice. Egyptian roots here, probably. Um, and it came, it came from. I was like, maybe that's why. I love it. <laughs> um, but so <laughs> <laughs> my roots. Yeah. But, but um. That ancestor, it's down the matriarchal side. So it means a woman left North Africa um, thousands of years ago. And uh, she's my ancestor and she traveled into Europe. And that's why I'm, the, I'm from there. But she came from North Africa. I still want to do a 23 and Do it. It's I, so interesting. Oh, I want to do it too. 
it's so well, just to I, know. I, I kept saying until I get an apartment, I just got an apartment, so I'm going to do now. This you, you test, yeah. Now I can there test. you go. Yeah. But I, I recommend doing it. It's so fascinating and being like I found other like stuff the as full well. Test right, not just the you have like the cheap one and you have like no. The, I did the full thing. I yes, did the exactly, health the and the thing. DNA yeah, and that the, as well. Oh but, wow. But, but that was interesting that they could track that and it, that, so that whole genealogy came down from one woman that left North Africa so many centuries ago. But that does show, like I just made a video on this a couple of weeks ago that, um, so we have all these different people in the world and we figured out that approximately 50,000 years ago, there were three tribes in Africa. They all eventually spread, but we all are descendants from them. So mm -hmm. they interbred with others around the globe. Mm -hmm. So they spread the line. But when you go back far enough, 50,000 years ago, we all come from those three tribes. There's no right. one on the planet who, who lives today. It's not who, part of the tribe. Who's not part of the tribe. So we're all one family. There we're is a from Wakanda. There's a video <laughs> by that Robert Seffer guy who always has some yeah. out there conspiracy that he's trying to debunk everything on planet Earth. And he's saying, you know, out of Africa debunked, right? In this video, it's like 15 minute video. I'm actually having guts at Gibbon next week. I, she told me the same thing that she, I, I sent her the same thing. I said, you have to debunk this video. Well, I told her, will you come on you with me? I'll play it. And she's going to debunk it and show that what you're saying is actually what she's saying yeah. is the yeah. facts. Wow. We, we, you can see it in the DNA. Like we, we do have ghost species in our DNA that we found. We don't know who they were. We don't mm -hmm. know who these hominins were these homogeneous people we know they have existed because we can find them in our dna but we haven't found them in the fossil record yet but we make so many discoveries at this point in yeah. time it's only a matter of time before we find one or two of these ghost species and learn more about where we as a species came from there's so much that they're still to uncover it's amazing it's like going back there's a theory that we are in the um you know, like the prototype of a computer game where they make they before they make a game and release it, they just make a like a kind of waiting room computer game, yeah. which has a certain limitations. And that's where you can build all your prototypes and all the functions and stuff. And someone was like, I think that's what we're in that. Um, <laughs> and the previous like hominids were like the previous prototypes of the game. But now we're in this one and the, the latest development the laws of physics and there's nobody running the game it's just the it's just the yeah. pre-game there's no one playing it <laughs> we're just in this thing i'm like okay well, when people say that you know evolution isn't real because we stopped evolving we never stopped evolving oh we've right. evolved white skin, look at our look yeah, at but like white skin is really recent blue eyes yeah. is a new mutation blonde hair it's a new mutation it didn't exist like fifteen thousand years ago so yeah. we keep evolving and eventually we will as a species diverge again there will become a new branch in this evolutionary timeline where there will be a new species <gasps> that's different from us because eventually a mutation just like in the Gonna past happen. will take over i also want to see that movie me too <laughs> so let's write that movie <laughs> sapien 2.0 yeah, yeah. <laughs> the movie planet of the Sapien. right hey you yeah. would act you'd be the actor you planet know, the of the actor. sapiens yeah <laughs> yeah and you've got old homo sapiens like the old school homo sapiens mm -hmm. just there being like i will digitally <laughs> fight you with my digital drones <laughs> <laughs> but no yeah. hopefully this i think hopefully we're going to come full circle to our like ancestral sapiens and we're going to start really plugging into the the potential of our planet and our and our our physics and stuff that would seem like improbable to our understanding of the quantum physics but maybe that there, there are certain things in the world that we could tap into that we yeah. could access that we could i'd love that right. psychologically um maybe they, we become telepathic again do you know what i mean yeah. like we could because i think this yeah, yeah i just natural bluetooth yeah ex yeah exactly i think that there's uh, the more that uh, but maybe we do have to do something like radically shift away from uh the journey of relying entirely or they just give us chips inside our brain well, that we just that works. Yeah. that works i'll do it i mean either we, way we could become partial ai either yeah. way but i think that's coming next 
but yeah i think there's like i don't know there's so much to the that we don't understand we don't understand 96 percent of the ocean we don't understand what dark matter is we don't understand but we just know it all relates together and yeah. there's yeah we just know it's there we just know it's there right no yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we, just know, we know we're super old right yeah that's a fact that is definitely and some people still deny that too you know we're getting older no a hundred like scientific fact Three hundred thousand yeah. years at least. Yeah, yeah. yeah. With the, the the oldest uh Homo sapiens fossils were found at Jebel Irut in Morocco, and they're three hundred thousand years old. People will say those are real. Those old. are fake. They're fake fossils. They're not fake. No. Anthropologists just just have a little bit of a hard time with it because they look like other fossils in the record, but that also shows that these were probably among the oldest first homo sapiens yes right. we, we don't expect it to go back another hundred thousand years maybe 20 maybe 30 50 max i feel right i, I feel like the three hundred and fifty thousand years ago really is the max of the emergence of homo sapiens <laughs> but there's right. three hundred and fifty thousand years and they're time. saying that we only invented like writing and how to like live in a little community in the last 6,000. Sorry. Wow. That's what I'm saying. Like, I don't think, um, I don't think that, uh, well, even if writing, let's say was somewhat recent communication, obviously mm. isn't. Oh, language the, is really old. Language. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Like it, that Neanderthals even had the same hyoid bone as us. So Neanderthals were able to communicate. They were able to speak and Neanderthals emerged at least 400,000 years ago. So we know that language is at least that old. We haven't and we were sleeping with them, hominins, but still, we yeah, were we were mating with the Neanderthals. So they must have had yeah. deep voices. Hey, girl, come over here. You know what I mean? Like, it's gotta <laughs> hey, be. Here. Yeah, the Morgan <laughs> Freeman of the uh, the ancient world. <laughs> but yeah. but um, actually, I recently saw a video with Morgan Freeman on helium. Hilarious. Just Google that in your spare time. Yeah, uh, we'll thank you later. Um, but also there's other ways to communicate. Like I'm learning sign language right yeah. now and it's a completely visual communication system. No writing, no, yeah. uh, no sounds. It's all just a visual way of communicating. And what's crazy is that I was signing to a guy who was about 20 foot on the other side of a room and it was a room full of people and we were, t were having a conversation and it was the first time I experienced that. And it was really weird because you're used to talking to somebody and having to be really close yeah. and you get yeah. too far and you're like, oh, hey, you want to go? And this time we were just talking and I was like, oh, this is like weird. I can like, I can understand you. And, and yeah, but so as long as you can see the person, you can communicate. Also, what's interesting is that we're used to conversate, hearing conversations as being quite private because again, mm -hmm. the further you go, you can't hear. I went to, um, in the UK recently, there was a big uh, rally for sign language to try and make sign language a yeah. recognized language. Um, so thousands of people turned up to London and everybody was signing. And it was really weird because I could also see, and if you understand sign language, I could I could see what people were saying. Like I could I could tap into everybody's yeah, uh, tap into conversations. conversations. I could be like, interesting, interesting, interesting. And, and yeah, it's just a different way of communicating and I'm just yeah. kidding. <laughs> no, no, no. A waiter in a restaurant, they go by the tables and they hear every conversation. Yeah. So like they can listen in every, mm. every time. But with you, with the sign language, it's like the same. You yeah. can sneakily listen. Like I, I'm like, oh, this is like, it's quite, I mean, oh. should I not? Is it? A, is there a rule? It's very private. <laughs> but yeah, it's, so yeah, language cannot necessarily be audio. They yeah. can have visual languages, audio yeah. languages, yeah. written languages. It's all just that, a way of, that is my final thing. I do have to go soon. Um, this yes, is, I don't know why. Like I love this so much that I just I got to say one more thing. Um, Steven Pinker, who's like a scientific guy, who's a skeptic like me, where he's like, I don't really know some of these ideas we have are maybe outdated. Nonetheless, they worked in our process of humans. But he had this point he brought up, and he wondered if the reason we believed in a god. OK, that there was something that wasn't us that we call God is the first time a man or a woman heard a voice in their own head talk. Hmm. You know how we think and we can talk in our head? Can oh, you yeah. Imagine what is that thing since it's not me, it's up here. And 
that concept was this is something above me and that isn't me. Maybe this is the God. Mm. And but so then there are some people that don't have that inner. Yeah, not dialogue. everybody has an inner dialogue. Uh oh. Visual oh, thinker. Oh, I and I sometimes tell people who aren't. Can you, can, can you not, uh, do you not have an inner dialogue? I have an inner dialogue oh, right. and I am a visual thinker. So right. when people tell me something, I visualize yeah. while I have an inner dialogue visualizing that with me. Yeah. So when I read a book, I, it's like a movie for me, but I have a friend who does not have an inner dialogue and they're not a visual thinker. And I just don't know how they exist. I don't, you know, this how is a question. Have... I'm yeah. wondering if that happened from the time we've been, can, can, um, what do you call that? What I was saying, Comp compartmentalize. I'm wondering if that was kind of part of the survival. Like you needed mm. to have that memory and that inner dialogue at some point. And now that we're starting to be able to compartmentalize things, maybe it's not necessary for some people who are being born today going, do I really need to be able to think this through and like have an inner voice and, yeah, and, and mm. your inner voice. If now I think about it, the time that I hear my inner voice the most is like the most crucial, like, oh no, don't touch that. Mm -hmm. Oh, you know, or like swearing. Survival. Or like it's it's yeah. a it's a thing being like, don't touch that. Like I, that's I'm I rarely hear my inner voice when I'm just like, mm, this is a nice sandwich. Like okay, it's right. um, yeah. it's normally something kind of where I'm talking to myself or being like, oh no 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 no. Like yeah, yeah. Um, hmm. that's funny. It's like the. The Jiminy Cricket, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> Your little like conscience that talks to you. That's... This is a bad idea, Johanna. <laughs> yeah, don't do it. Remember Peterson, last time. Yeah. George Peterson loves to talk about that movie. It's like it's some deep psychology behind it. It's pretty interesting. I'm not gonna lie. Well, that movie is pretty messed up. Like now that I, if you watch it again as an adult, it's quite a messed up movie with Jiminy. Like the kids go, the naughty kids get taken to an island and turned into donkeys where they're gonna like be turned into glue it's like the smoking God. and stuff and it's like <laughs> like oh, i was really scared i was gonna get turned to a donkey if i was bad when i was <laughs> young, I that movie because yeah. it was way too scary and it just it messed scary. Up. yeah so, so i watched it like once or twice and after that i just started crying every time it's quite, it's it horrible. was horrible put on and I just didn't want to watch it anymore. Oh, and even as an adult, I don't watch the movie. I mean, make, yeah, like you lie and your nose yeah. will get really big. I remember as a kid, I'd be like, did you do that? No. Right. <laughs> I'm just checking. Right? <laughs> did you spill uh, this? No. <laughs> <laughs> really affected well, me. Yeah. But, so do you guys but, have anything yeah. coming up that you want to promote while we're, while we're all closing out now? Oh, um, I mean, I guess I can. I don't know if I can. Yeah. Um, so recently I got involved with a really cool project um, and I, I'll shout them out on here. Uh, it, the, the, there's a series of documentaries called BAM, Builders of the Ancient Mysteries. Oh, and wow. they are an amazing French filmmaking company. And they've gone mm. to all the ancient sites in the world and they're just collecting all the data, all the science, and then making a series of documentaries that are really concise and really informative. Um, but they had a problem because the, um, the voiceover uh, the translation wasn't very good. So I uh, got in touch with them and said, I would love to um, narrate your uh, videos in English. And so I recently went yeah, to record great. the narration. And so that's going to be coming out in the next few weeks. So you'd be able to wow. watch um, nice. like the proper uh, English version. Yeah. Um, because I think the videos basically, if you, if you're new to the subject of ancient mysteries or ancient civilizations, or if you just want one concise thing to show your friends or introduce your family to bam, built, Builders of the Ancient Mysteries. It's a nice. really good bit film, and I'm really proud of it. So wow. that's coming. Yeah. Nice. Hopefully that's on cool. Amazon or somewhere. Hopefully. Yeah. Yeah. I only have the uh, Egypt tour with Annie XT because I'm doing oh. my Egypt tour. Well, we're going on tour yeah, to we're Egypt. We're going on tour, and then I'm staying wow. in Egypt. And doing she's going back home, and then I have wow. my tour from October 5th until October 16th. So go to Speaking of October. Yeah, Speaking of October, me and, me and Derek are going oh, yeah. to Israel in October. Ooh. Oh, I'm so jealous. I'm gonna go. Oh, for, yeah, for you guys, for your your fans that are watching this, look out yeah. for us. We're going to Israel. We're doing a tour there. We're gonna look yeah. for all the ancient sites. We're gonna look for John the Baptist's tomb. I want to go to Hani the Circle Jars uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're tomb as well. Yes. Everything. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Big stuff on the way. Degrees. Amazing. Yeah. Look at us on tour. Yeah, look at all. <laughs> YouTubers on tour. Great. Right. Yes. 
Hey, uh, I want to say thank you also for uh, having both of you join and hanging out with us today. No, this has been great. What yeah. a great Thursday night. Well, we got to go have some dinner now, girls. <laughs> yeah, me too. I'm going to go eat. It's four, it's four yeah. o'clock in New York. Four p.m. And no, it's nine p.m. here, so we've got to go and eat. Wow. Uh, yeah. But thank well, gentlemen. It's been great. Well, like thank I always, you. like I always say at the end, you have just attained true gnosis. You have just attained true gnosis. The Demiurge has no power over you. Jesus.